And hello and welcome to yet another edition of Sci-Fun Voices, our monthly panel series where we talk about stuff that's interesting to scientists. I'm Jai Ranganathan, Executive Director of Sci-Fun Challenge, a nonprofit focused on closing the gap between science and society. So this month, I think we want to talk about crowdfunding, particularly science crowdfunding. Uh, if you look at the news over the past several months, there's been maybe a backlash, maybe something of a reassessment of crowdfunding generally. You can look at the New York Times a few weeks ago had a story about a fiasco that occurred with uh, a majorly funded coffee maker, but it was sort of a, an assessment of crowdfunding generally. But also within science crowdfunding, there's been something of a reassessment among some about you know the role of crowdfunding. Does it make sense? So let's have that conversation. We've got a great panel uh, to talk about this, um, and if you, and we want to get you, the audience, involved in this conversation. If you're watching this in Google Plus, there's a little bug, there's a little uh, tab there for the Q and A button. Please ask your questions there. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can ask questions via Twitter. Just use the Sci Fund hashtag so we can see it. That's S C I F U N D. That's S C I F U N D. Uh, if you use that hashtag, we'll see the question and we'll be sure to ask it. So with that, let's get started with our panelists. I would first like to introduce uh, Dr. Jacqueline Gill, who is an ecologist and a uh, professor at the University of Maine. And uh, she recently raised uh, over $10,000 for her research over um, for her research using science crowdfunding. And um, she had an experience that she didn't quite expect. So Jacqueline, maybe you could uh, talk about your experience. Yeah. So. I have a couple of graduate students and we've been developing this really exciting research project in the Falkland Islands which uh, involving how um, penguins respond to climate change. There's been a lot of really cool things that have gone on there. So this is I'm an, an, a second year assistant professor at the University of Maine and we, you know, we're still trying to get our research off the ground in my lab and you know writing grants and things like that and so I really saw crowdfunding as an opportunity to generate some seed money to get some pilot data that could then go into a more formal science funding endeavor um, and so we thought okay the Falklands is going to be this really great experience this really cool opportunity to bring people sort of metaphorically with us on this awesome adventure to this new place there are penguins um, it should I have you know I was thinking to myself, you know, I have a lot of followers on Twitter. Um, I've, at that point, I had about 6,500, I think. And, um, and I really thought that this would kind of sell itself. It would be a relatively easy process. And so what I wasn't expecting was how much work it would be. And when I say it was a lot of work, I should, first of all, give an incredible amount of credit to my two students who put together, um, Dulce Agroff and, and Kit Hamley, put together this fantastic website through experiment.com. So we went with an actual platform. Um, to do our crowdfunding, and we went with Experiment because, you know, we knew that most most of these websites take a certain amount of overhead. Um, we were fine with that. What we liked was the legitimacy that Experiment added to us. It's a science-specific funding platform, um, and so we liked that they offered a really nice interface. Um, and so we put this website together. Um, we launched it, and it was an incredible amount of work and uh, to raise the, the money in time. And I, I think I was expecting it to be a little easier, considering the, the, the number of followers that I have on Twitter. Um, we decided to aim high for our first um, opportunity. Partly, you know, $10,000 is a lot, especially for your first time. And we did that for a couple of reasons. One, um, I was thinking, okay, I've got a pretty good so social media base. Um, and two, we have two students that are involved in this trip. And I, uh, the last thing I wanted to do was pit them against each other in terms of funding. So we really crafted, a, you know, our, our campaign around both of them together as this sort of collaborative research project, which reflects the research they're really doing. And so a lot of people were like, why did you ask for so much money? And um, that was one of the reasons is, you know, I didn't want to create two accounts for two students that were then competing for, for, this, for limited resources. And yeah, so I would just say that the, the biggest surprise for me was how much work it was and how, um, just in terms of really getting it out there to people, um, there was, you know, a lot of people were really enthusiastic about the page, but getting people to give was really tricky. Um, we ended up halfway through offering incentives and that I think helped a little bit. Um, 
I, w I learned about the crowdfunding parabola, that there's a lot of interest in the beginning and then it really drops off for the majority of the campaign and then picks up a lot at the end. That definitely reflects our experience. Um, but the big thing was really for me, um, you know, we were successful. We got more than $10,000. Um, we did have a matching donor, um, Arthur Chu, the um, big thanks to him, the Jeopardy winner, um, decided to, to match donations up to $1,000 for a period and also shared it with his followers, which is or way more than what I have. Um, but for me, you know, the experience itself was, was great, um, but what really surprised me was how how much work it it really was in terms of just really you really have to get it out there in front of people a lot um, and I I'd really hesitate to do it again soon because I very much felt like I was passing the hat and passing the hat to my followers and you know if if another one of my students for example you know one working on bison wanted to do this. Um, then I, I would I wouldn't I'd be really hesitant to do more than one a year and in fact even even at that rate I'd really worry about kind of exhausting people um, by asking them for a lot of money um, and that may just be you know my own personal feelings but I I, I I left the experience thinking this is really cool we got a lot of interest in our science we feel like people are really feel like they're stakeholders in the in the research itself um, and it sort of was a natural way to do some outreach but I don't see it as a replacement for you know the majority of the funding that you know we'll do in my lab because you know I, I I just really worry I worry that people are already getting tapped out I worry that with the, the science crowdfunding especially that people are starting to starting to feel like they've you know already been given you know the novelties wearing off they've given a bit um, and I would like I said it's not something I would feel comfortable doing even more than once a year let alone you know uh, you know, for every student that I have in my lab, but at the same time, it was also you know a nice opportunity to to bring in money to do some to, some, to get some pilot work done. So it's 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 I wouldn't say it's it was a disappointing experience. It was a really positive experience. Experiment.com was great. They worked w well with us. They were fantastic. But I I don't I, I've seen I've seen a lot of rhetoric about how crowdfunding is sort of the solution to all of our science funding problems, and I don't really think that that is going to pan out. So that that's sort of my 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 ca my caveat. So a question for you, which is, so if crowdfunding is all about your crowd, and you had a you had a you obviously have a big crowd if you think of your Twitter followers and and your blog and that sort of thing, but was it the right crowd? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point because I mean it's a lot of my a lot of my Twitter followers and a lot of my blog readers are. Um, there are other scientists, um, they are science journalists, and they're already, so it's already a pool that's being tapped on a pretty regular basis. Um, they're people who are supportive of our work, they are, they understand probably better than many people, you know, all the, we got a lot of donations from, you know, bird scientists, for example, because they, they definitely think the system's cool, they understand that it's important. But honestly, I would say that probably our, our largest demographic in terms of givers were graduate students, which really floored me, because I was like, you guys are not the ones that are supposed to be funding this, right? You guys are the ones that are supposed to be, you know, I don't want you making a decision about whether you know you get to eat real food this week or you know give a hundred dollars to a crowdfunding campaign, and there there were relatively fewer um, you know faculty, for example, that were that were giving. That was a surprise, but even so, it's I run into the same problem I run into when I think about my outreach, which is that um, you know when I got on Twitter, I thought it would be how I would talk to the world. And the first people I found were scientists and science communicators. And it's been an incredibly positive experience for me, and I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. But I still have had a hard time reaching people who aren't you know, easy to find, right? Just the, the folks that I thought I'd reach in the first place, just members of the general public who care about science or think it's cool. And, um, and I think that if I could reach some of those people, um, I'd be really curious to see you know, how, how do you tap into new new audiences, not only in terms of people, bringing people in to be interested in your research, which I think is a strength of crowdfunding, but also just so you don't get donor fatigue by going to the same pool. I mean, I've already donated to several crowdfunding campaigns myself, so at a certain point, are we just like shuffling the money around? Um, I don't know. Okay, and with that, lots of great points there. Um, I'd like to... Uh... I, what am I trying to say here? I'd like to continue the conversation with Dr. Lenny Teitelman or Teitelman? Teitelman. Teitelman. 
He is a uh, molecular biologist and co-founder of Protocols.io, a, uh, a startup working on life sciences issues. Now, you also ran a recent crowdfunding campaign uh, to fund uh, an app for life sciences research, and you wrote a, two blog posts at the end of that, uh, that uh, describing your experience, and you ended your second blog post saying, crowdfunding isn't well suited for supporting high quality research. And so I'd love to hear about your experience with crowdfunding and how you ended up at that conclusion. Yep. So I think we've had a very similar experience to Jacqueline in the sense that we were surprised to find out. We knew it would be a lot of work. We knew that you know we'd have to devote a month. I ended up sleeping maybe three, four hours on average every night. It was just nonstop work for the duration of the month. We knew it would be a lot of work. We didn't know how much work it would be, and we didn't know how poor it would be at getting the funding that we thought we would get. After all of the research that we had done, we wildly overestimated not how many backers we could get. You know, we were on target with how many backers. We wildly overestimated how much people actually end up giving. And what I want to be very clear about is our experience, as I wrote in the blog post, um, the Kickstarter campaign, I think it's safe to say, saved our company. Right? So it showed a tremendous response from the science community. It got us our first commercial partner, validating our business model and making it much more likely that we got, you know, allowing us to get the investments subsequent to this. Um, I don't know if Protocols IO would have existed without the Kickstarter campaign. So we were successful. It was one of the hardest things we have done as a startup. Um, it was one of the smartest things we have done. I don't know if we'd be alive without it. The problem comes in that when you're doing Kickstarter, right, so we got 500 backers, we didn't get nearly as much money, you know, we were shooting for 50K, we thought we could get $100 a person. Turns out people give more uh, like $30 uh, on average uh, than what you expect. And so in the end, we went into this crisis management mode where you basically do save our souls to the uh, family and you know, four of our closest family ended up giving 30,000 of the 50K that we got, right? So that's not something we expected, right? Um, but here's the real problem when it comes to research crowdfunding. Protocols IO needs users, it needs awareness, right? It needs investors, um, it needs marketing, and for all of these things, our crowdfunding campaign delivered and was fantastic. It was worth the month of work. What it's not good for is the funding. And what researchers need isn't marketing, it isn't users, it's the research dollars to do the work. And so you're looking, with Protocols IO, you're looking at a company that had raised half a million dollars of angel investments. We had built tools, it wasn't to validate an idea. We had thousands of users, right? We had every major blogger uh, tweeting and blogging about us on Discover, on Scientific American. So the press the buzz around it was extraordinary. And it was great for us because you know, that, that's what helped us survive, but it's not good for funding. And a typical scientist does not have thousands of Twitter followers, does not have thousands of users on the platform that they've built that they can lean on for the support. And in the end, you know, if we are thinking of research crowdfunding as in the conversations that I have with the founders, co-founders of experiment.com, if the position is that this isn't really so much about the funding for the scientists, but it's more about outreach, well, then you have to ask, is this a good way of doing outreach? And if we were upfront about how hard it would be, how little money you can get, and the fact that for most scientists, it's harder to pull off a $5,000 crowdfunding campaign on experiment.com than it is to get an NIH grant. If we were upfront about this, then my question is, how many scientists would do this? Uh, Jay, I think you're off. You can't hear you, Yes, Jay. let's try this again. Well, this seems like a great spot to bring another person to the conversation, Ethan Perlstein, Dr. Ethan Perlstein, who is a pharmacological researcher and a founder of uh, Perlstein Labs, uh, a startup working on uh, finding medical cures to little studied diseases. Um, 
And he's done a lot. He's done a lot with crowdfunding himself, raising twenty five thousand dollars for his own research, but also doing a lot of research um, on his uh, about sort of what works and what doesn't work for science crowdfunding. So when you hear uh, Jacqueline Gill and Lenny uh, Lenny Tatelman speaking, what's your, what's your what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. Having been a campaign manager for a, a charitable slash campaign driven. Uh, a crowdfunding project, which is typical of experiment.com, typical of Kickstarter, I totally agree that donor fatigue is a problem. Um, I totally agree that raising anything comparable to uh, even an RO3, which is sort of your exploratory grant that's you know 25k, I agree that that is a, a Herculean task for for most people, and I would advise against the proliferation of this kind of Kickstarter um, you know based model um, for all the reasons that were said. Um, but I think that what I've always said. Um, you know, going back for years, it was almost three years ago where we did our, our Rocket Hub campaign. What I've been saying ever since was that I'm, I'm actually surprised that all, in all this time that's gone by with all these examples of people like Jacqueline and others where they've raised a, a decent amount where they could actually do science. $5,000 is not nothing. I think people in biomed tend to kind of dismiss $5,000, $10,000 as though it's chump change. I know ecologists and others value that money tremendously and, and even in, bio, in biomed that money can actually go, go quite far if you do the right kind of experiments. So the thing I've always been saying to people is yes, donor fatigue, the, the campaign driven model is not necessarily tenable, but it is tenable for people to, to replicate what Jacqueline and her students have done. And I, I frankly don't understand why more labs haven't, uh, especially if you focus it as an outreach training exercise, not for the PIs. The PIs should be spending their time writing grants. As, as disheartening and, and um, you know, frustrating as that process is, their time is way better spent doing that. But the trainees, um, I see no reason why, especially starting out in the beginning of grad school, when they might be starting up a blog and tweeting, um, why they couldn't incorporate some kind of crowdfunding element to their research. Not that they would completely fund their PhD this way, but why not do an exploratory experiment? I don't understand why more people haven't tried in all these years with all the blogs that are out there, with all this N equals one stories now, which make for a lot of ends. I mean, experiment.com has raised almost $2 million across all of their projects, and that's across almost 300 projects. So there's lots and lots of examples of different kinds of science, different kinds of labs doing this. And But, but people still kind of make excuses as for why, well, of course it's not going to scale, but, but these people making these, these claims have never even tried, I bet, or encouraged their students to, to even do a small scale kind of project, which I think everyone agrees is pretty, pretty much worthwhile, whether or not it leads to a repeat uh, you know, a campaign or whether or not it leads to more stable following, that's another story. But even just trying once, I'd like to see more people do that as opposed to immediately you know, taking us to a, a theoretical discussion about, well, will crowdfunding scale? Well, well, I mean, yes, of course, it's probably not going to replace the NIH anytime soon in any fantasy world possible. But again, the five to ten thousand dollar experiments that are driven mostly by trainees with a, with a heavy outreach uh, uh, component, why don't we see more of those? I don't quite understand what the culture is that's impeding people from doing those kinds of experiments. What do you think? Go for it, Lenny. So. Uh, Good, good points. I think we're in broad agreement with Ethan on many things. But what I would say is, you know, let's be very realistic. Five to ten thousand dollars is not possible for the vast majority of scientists, right? We again, Jacqueline raised ten k through a month of work as a PI with a huge Twitter following. We raised without, if you exclude those four relatives that were, you know, the the rescuers, we raised twenty thousand. Right, after a month of work as a company that had raised half a million dollars, had tons of press, tons of Twitter buzz, you were helping us, everybody in, who is in science and on Twitter was helping us, was writing about us. It is impossible to get five to ten thousand dollars. And what my blog post shows, and I think this is the real problem, is that the experience for many of the people who try the experiment.com projects is that they're doing outreach to their family that already knows what they're doing. They're, they're not broadening their demographic. They're not, you know, if you're Jonathan Eisen, you have 30,000 Twitter followers, you, you might be able to, without too much work, get $5,000. But if you're a student and you don't have a Twitter following, right, you, you're going to be getting that $1,000 from your mom and dad and your lab mates. And that is not outreach, and that's not a good use of the student's time who should be doing research and should be progressing in their PhD. And that's why I think there's so much hesitation. So Lenny, I'd like to push back a little bit on that um, to say to compare it to another process which scientists are familiar with, which is writing grants. So as you start out as a graduate student writing grants, no one's starting out writing out a, a million dollar grant or you start writing small grants for 
low thousands, maybe some departmental funding, maybe some private sources, you know, maybe an NIH dissertation approval grant, but it's small amounts of cash. And I very much see crowdfunding as the same way in the sense that, you know, you might well ask, um, you might well ask, you know, is it a failure that graduate students aren't getting million dollar, million dollar NIH grants? And the answer is, well, that doesn't make any sense, you know, because like they're not in the right position to do it. And so I would wonder, like, if we, you, Len, you made some, a really excellent point about um, that, you know, essentially maybe we were mark if you're marketing to our families, like, how far are we actually going to get? Great point, but doesn't that argue, doesn't that argue for the point that say that hey, this makes outreach all the more important of engaging with larger audiences? Not to say we should engage these people just to ask them for cash, but it sort of helps incentivize talking to people other than your family over the long term, wouldn't you say? Um, so students don't write in age grants typically. No, um, but I'm saying no. I'm, by the faculty, right? So he, the the question is, if I'm a new student and I don't have a Twitter following. What do I do? I can spend the next six years trying to get to 3,000 Twitter followers and then run a campaign over the course of a month. But th there is no way to raise anything that's more than you know a thousand to two thousand dollars if you're a student. Um, if this you know is this an interesting exercise? I think if you're upfront with the students saying that look, you're going to spend a lot of time creating this project on Experiment.com, you will list it, and nothing will happen because Experiment.com doesn't bring you the funding. It doesn't. It's not a platform that it advertises for you. You do the advertising. You have to reach out to your friends and colleagues, right? And the only people you reach out to are your friends and colleagues, essentially. And so, in the end, if we are upfront about it, that you'll do all of this work and you'll get a thousand dollars in the end, um, is that a good incentive for public outreach? I think that there are tons and tons of things we should be and are doing and should be doing more of for public outreach, but the biggest problem with science outreach is that there are no good incentives for the scientists to engage and spend their time on science outreach. Right? Nature has written about this. The big problem is there isn't a great incentive, and I don't see research crowdfunding running this over the course of a month to get $1,000 from your friends and family as a good incentive to do more outreach. I think it burns people out. Most of them fail. Most of them end up getting it from their family or self-funding it, and so then the question is, what kind of incentive is this for outreach? I'd like to bring Aurora Thornhill into the conversation, um, who is the science lead at Kickstarter, because I think she might have some um, insights here, because, you know, it's not because obviously Kickstarter is, there's been a lot of money raised on Kickstarter in other fields, and so what's your take on all this? Because you have been experienced not just the science side, but with all sorts of other parts where, you know, Kickstarter is famous on the music side and other things. So what's your take? My take is that uh, a lot of the challenges that I'm hearing um, you guys talk about are very similar to challenges other communities had on Kickstarter during the early days of crowdfunding. Um, I think as crowdfunding moves to new communities um, and new, you know, types of crowdfunding, um, a lot of the challenges are the same. A lot of the challenges are different. So, you know, for example, uh, the idea that, you know, if you put a project um, on a crowdfunding site, um, you're going to get engagement. Um, it is a lot of work. You do have to do work. Um, so my take, you know, from Kickstarter's perspective um, with science projects is um, I try really hard to sort of educate people on what to expect, um, and best practices, what to get into, because I feel like this is a community that doesn't have a lot of that knowledge floating around. We even saw a lot of this in the early days of some major categories on Kickstarter, like the technology category and games category. These are now categories um, that drive a lot of projects um, and are quite successful and raise a lot of funds. But in the early days, people were still str struggling to figure out the best way to use the platform to engage with their communities and engage with potential backers uh, to find success. Um, so you'll see, like in the early days of Kickstarter, a lot of our projects were very small projects with lower goals. Um, a lot of early Kickstarter creators started out with small projects with low goals um, as they were figuring things out and then you know they built upon that and as the knowledge gets passed around the community um, everybody starts adopting best practices and figuring out the best ways to do this. Um, and I also think that crowdfunding does not and should not replace uh, National uh, Science Foundation grants um, and the like. I think that these systems, you know, as we saw in Kickstarter, uh, you know, we've matched um, the uh, 
arts funding from the U.S. government, but uh, that took time. Um, that took a lot of time, and it doesn't mean that Kickstarter has replaced arts funding in the U.S. It means that it's another system that works alongside an existing thing um, and can potentially bring more accessibility to those who might not have uh, access to funds to do what they want to do. And I see uh, a similar thing starting to happen with science. Um, I do not think, I think it's dangerous to say that like crowdfunding is a solution for you know whatever problem, especially with science, um, but I do think that there, there are certain types of projects um, and certain types of communities that you can reach uh, via crowdfunding that you might not be able to otherwise and certain types of projects that can get funding that might not be able to get funding uh, through traditional channels. So if we were to look at that, Aurora, um, if you were to say look at those communities that sort of spread best practices along, what, if you pick a, like a given community that is raising lots of cash, like what were those best practices they just started spreading around? So uh, for uh, games and technology, um, a lot of it you know, they're pretty good at outreach, um, but maybe like the artist community, not necessarily. Uh, so a lot of it is best practices on how to build up your community before your Kickstarter campaign, um, how to figure out how to promote your Kickstarter campaign, because these days just having a crowdfunding project is not exciting in and of itself. It's figuring out like core messaging. Um, a lot of this happened organically via blog posts that were written and then shared across these communities because um, they're very close-knit networks. Um, so yeah, uh, let me try to think of some other examples of best practices uh, that got shared. Uh, for science, I think rewards, um, you know, especially for the technology community, so one subset of the technology community that I think, um, you know, like protocols.io was software, it's an app. Um, software on Kickstarter is traditionally a lot harder to uh, fund than other types of projects because you don't have a tangible thing that you're necessarily giving somebody. And most of the time people want to focus on their software, not focus on making physical goods to give to people. So I think over the course of uh, you know the past few years, people are starting to hone their uh, their skills and their ability to create rewards that are compelling um, that don't take away what they're doing in that arena. And I see science having a similar issue because you, you want to focus on your research. You don't want to make a bunch of t-shirts uh, and have to focus on making a bunch of t-shirts to ship to people over the next few months. So figuring out compelling ways to share what you're doing and share your research with people who are exciting uh, and give them incentives because I do think that it's hard to get this model to work without some sort of exchange. Um, and, you know, that's why rewards are very important on Kickstarter. Uh, can I comment? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, so that was something that we ran into, and I think that that's one way in which science crowdfunding is, can be fundamentally different from the really successful models we've seen, because when I crowdfund a video game, I'm doing it because I get a video game. When I crowdfund, you know, a, a cool t-shirt press, it's I'm doing it because I get a t-shirt. I'm not doing it necessarily just because I, I want to, you know, support that endeavor. And, you know, when you're crowdfunding research on climate change impacts on penguins, you know, you're not getting anything necessarily. There's no product. I mean, there's data and, you know, we, we can share that information, but, the, you know, that it's there's not the, necessarily the tangibles. And we thought very hard about whether or not we wanted to do any kind of incentive. And, you know, it came down to concerns that the incentives could be just as big of an endeavor as, you know, a business, you know, I could create enough t-shirts or I could crochet enough penguins um, that, you know, suddenly this takes on its own com complete project that's that's even bigger than, you know, the research project itself in terms of time commitment and also the money. We didn't want to spend our hard-earned research dollars on, you know, tchotchkes that we would then give back to people. And so, you know, we, we were concerned that that would be seen as a mismanagement of our money, right? And so, you know, one of the things that we ended up doing was was photographs. Um, so we basically gave p donors over a certain amount access to a database of pictures that we took. And for our really big donors, um, people who gave over $250, we gave um, printed calendars. And, you know, even that, you know, we took a hit financially by doing that um, because the money had to you know come from somewhere but I, I I think that that's something that we haven't really sufficiently addressed and 
And I'm not saying, I, I, you know, reading some of the comments on Twitter, I'm not saying that crowdfunding doesn't work or that it can't work, but I think that there's some ways in which crowdfunding science is fundamentally different than crowdfunding the arts or crowdfunding, you know, some of these other activities. And um, I would like to see us talk about that a little bit more because, you know, a graph or a, a scientific paper isn't an incentive, right? That's, um, so there needs, we need to think of some creative ways to make people feel like they're actually getting buy-in. So here's my take, and Ethan, my apologies, because you've heard me say this only about a billion times before. Um, so my take is, I think you're exactly right, Jacqueline, is that science crowdfunding is different because there isn't, most times there isn't the product, uh, there isn't the, this, well, not talking about like a t-shirt along the way, but something intrinsic to the work that the backers will get. Most science isn't that. And so, so, so how does this work? And my model has always been, well, NPR which is what does NPR do, is that they put out great programming all the time for free. They think you ought to listen to because they think it's worth listening to. And by doing so, they build audience and credibility. And so when they have a pledge drive every so often, it's awful and terrible and nobody likes it, but enough people give to help keep the lights on. And so I think that's the model for science crowdfunding, which is that scientists do outreach to larger audiences, which, which, which I completely agree. It's something that's hard to do. You know, not just talking to fellow scientists, but talking to larger audiences about our work on a regular basis. Um, not something that takes up all your time. Something that's like a small part of your of your of your professional life, uh, but consistent. And then every so often, maybe once a year, you put a you bang the can with that audience. Say, hey, how about some bucks to keep it going? And some of that audience hopefully will give because you know they've been paying attention to your blog or your public talks or your YouTube channel or whatever. Um, and even the ones who don't give, in some ways it's still a win because they're still connected to your science. So I feel it's a win-win overall. And here's the piece that I, here's the part I know Lenny's going to hate the most, uh, is that where I think this ends up is that I think where the, my guess, and this is just a guess, is that if, one is, if somebody is sort of consistently engaging with audiences over time, I think it is possible to hit, very few people do this of course, but it is possible to hit mid five figures raised on an annual basis. So, what do you guys think? That's my pitch. I would say, just one thing I want to know is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate uh, how interested people are in the science you're doing. Uh, I've seen a lot of projects on Kickstarter that do not have any tangible rewards or do similar models to um, Jacqueline's project, and people are excited enough about the thing they're doing, and I think that where that comes from is figuring out where your core community lives and then them being engaged enough, like Jay said, like once you have that engagement um, and you're keeping them engaged, then you do a Kickstarter project or an experiment.com project and you have this community that's willing to spread the word. But it does require, um, you know, work ahead of time and it also requires research and figuring out like where are the people, um, not just the scientists or the people who are already in your very sort of insular um, sort of you know, uh, immediate network for people beyond that that you may not have tapped. And I've seen this a lot where people are just really enthused and excited about being a part of uh, a science project um, in whatever way they can. But you do have to find them. If I can jump in, I think, Jai, I mean, I would, I would tend to agree with your, your vision, but I would say we're not going to get there, as everyone's pointed out, we're not going to get there by scaling up uh, charitable, uh, campaign-based, social media-driven, uh, projects that simply will not work. So I think we need to find other solutions and other models. So one thing that I think people have talked about, which is sort of a little secret of crowdfunding, is this matching idea, right? I mean, mm -hmm. everyone is kind of assuming we need to scale the large crowd, small dollars model. But I think that everyone's pointing out the flaws of that. I think we need to combine that with, uh, you know, small crowd, large dollars, uh, for example. So for example, I've seen many, many campaigns, uh, not just in science crowdfunding, where someone who, you know, for lack of a better word, an angel, for example, will come in and say, okay, you guys have raised 50% of your goal, I'm gonna match dollar for dollar going forward, right? And this kind of matching happens all the time. NPR does it at a bigger scale, in terms of individuals, but also corporate sponsors. 
And, but yet we don't really see that happening in the science crowdfunding space. I think we need to see more uh, of, of, and this probably is a way to get buy-in from the university's advancement and development offices if they're willing to share a little bit of their donor pool, is that you can sort of say, let's combine crowdfunding campaigns that include large crowds and small dollars, but also small crowds and large dollars, and see if we can stretch the goals that way. I think other ways to do it um, would simply be to have crowdfunding be starter projects that segue into grant proposals. And so that would require efforts by foundations and other larger stakeholders to say, hey, if you guys can go out there and through banging the pavement, passing the hat, however, whatever means necessary, if you can raise X amount of dollars, we'll come in there and we'll say, if you can get preliminary data from that, we'll guarantee or fast track or you know, more, more favorably review you know, this science if, if that preliminary data really needs to be scaled up into a, into a grant proposal. We need to do things like this because again, scaling up the large crowd, small dollars, ain't gonna work. And I, as much as I love experiment.com, they've been around for a couple years now, and I think the fact that they haven't had thousands of projects come through, yes, part of it is that we're in the early days of this, you know, of, of, of crowdfunding, and every community goes through this process. Artists, artists, musicians did all this, you know, 15 years ago, right? Uh, we forget their growing pains, but I think that we need, again, to find other models than just large crowd, small dollars. Lenny, I think you had something to say. So I, I just want to follow up on what Ethan said, which is, there are interesting things to explore, um, especially, and I've had these conversations with Ethan of, of the past year, um, as far as matching, as far as uh, local projects on pollution or something that you're unlikely to get funded by NIH and maybe the state comes in, right, or the local uh, health board. So there's stuff to explore there, but I think we have plenty of data at this point, Jai, to as, as Ethan said, to conclude that it doesn't work for a scientist, right? Unlike a technology company, unlike NPR, which is all about content and an audience, a scientist doesn't have it, right? A beginning graduate student doesn't have it. And considering how overwhelmed, right, and stressed the scientists are already in terms of uh, trying to publish, trying to do the work, not having enough time, and not being able to get the funding that they need to do the work, what I'm asking is, if you now ask, if, if you're now giving them a proposal to spend a month and not get anything in return other than a thousand dollars after really hard work and getting most of it from your friends and family, is this just distracting them from the other ways of getting funding and from moving forward on their career, right? So we have to be mindful of the fact that scientists are pressed for time. It's the time that they lack. And so it's not just this random, well, you throw up a project, it's five minutes, you tweet about it, it's done, right? And then it brings you $5,000. It won't. It's hard work, morning to night, over the course of a month, even for somebody like Jacqueline with a huge Twitter follower. So I, as the moderator, I shouldn't say anything, but I have to. Oh, I'm bursting with things to say. So I'll say something quick, and I'll get it back to everybody else. So. Um, you make good points. You're absolutely right that time is like I'm sure money is tight among scientists, but time is the most precious commodity that, that scientists have. And how are you going to fit this in? You know, when how are you supposed to do this outreach and this crowdfunding? Like when people are already too strapped as it is. And my argument is, is there's there's secondary benefits from all of this, which are actually maybe even bigger, arguably bigger than the cash, and even even at the jump. And that the first thing is communication training. You know, I think there is a stereotype that scientists are bad at talking to the public, but the flip side is that they're pretty good at talking to each other. Well, reading scientific papers makes me tell, make, tells me they're terrible at talking to each other too. You know, and so I, I can say that our last paper, you know, where we, you know, our, where we communicate our sci fund results, got a lot of attention. And one of the reasons why was because we used all our communications training and writing it, and it made a huge difference. So all the tools you use for sort of engaging, you know, engaging people and, and getting a clear message across. That's actually really useful and really transferable. So I would say that money is certainly one of the benefits of this, but communication, that, that's, boy, that's something super useful and something, frankly, scientists don't get as part of their training. Jai, but you're making a really good case for taking a communication class rather than running a crowdfunding project. Well, but then again, I th well, okay. I'm going to stop because I don't want to... I want to other people. Yeah, we can look at that. that, that, that well, a communications budget. class you have to uh, pay for as well, so... Uh, you're not necessarily getting the exchange, same exchange. Uh, like, I do agree with Jay's point, is that, like, when you run a project, uh, you're getting a lot more out of it than funds. Funds, obviously, 
that's something that people need uh, to do what they're doing to do their research. But you're also, you know, learning the best ways to engage with your community. And even a failed project, I think, um, can teach people a lot of lessons. And also to your point that like experiment.com has been around for two years and we haven't seen a blockbuster there yet. It took Kickstarter. Uh, it wasn't really until like uh, end of 2011, beginning of 2012, that we started to see things really take off in the categories that are now considered um, sort of like gold on Kickstarter, like games and technology. Uh, so I do think that these things take time. Um, and one thing that we tried to do, um, it was me, uh, a member, uh, somebody from the Citizen Cyber Science Center, which is a cooperation between CERN, uh, UNITARD, and University of Geneva, and ITP, um, it's a subset of NYU in New York City. We hosted a hackathon weekend uh, for scientists where we selected uh, 16 projects to participate, and we paired them up with uh, people could sort of fill out that skill set that they may be lacking um, to essentially give them that additional help. Um, and also, it was an educational experience as well. So not only were they getting people who would you know help them with their graphics, they were also learning how to do this stuff in the same weekend. And I think leaning on others within your community and other people you know, uh, you know, friends you know who may have the skills that you don't have to get things off the ground is also really important for running a campaign. It doesn't need to be something that you're going in on alone. Uh, you should lean on your community and those around you to help fill those gaps. So, but I mean, it seems like even with Kickstarter, the really successful projects are the ones that are either by famous people, right? Like if LeVar Burton wants to bring back Reading Rainbow, you know, he has access to all kinds of, you know, resources. Um, and, you know, we're not all going to be able to be LeVar Burton, right? And but so you're either you're either LeVar Burton or it's a, it's a case where there's some cool little project that somebody finds and then writes about on io9 or one of these other you know basically signal boosts for you and that's you know so e even even with kickstarter it seems like the to be to be successful there has to be some sort of viral aspect to it and that is going to be a lot harder for scientists because i don't see science journalists necessarily having a model where they're going to write about work in development, right? Because in unlike, you know, um, a project like bringing, you know, putting together a new a new film, um, you know, the, the turnaround time on my research is, is going to be much longer. Um, and so, you know, it would have been nice if a journalist could have written about the cool work we're going to do in the Falklands, but it's, it's the story isn't there yet. It's a lot of questions, and that's just not the model that journalism is really following right now so we, we I'm just I'm just kind of pushing back a little bit on on that I guess Aurora so what do you think so Jacqueline's saying you either need to be already famous and have a giant audience or you need to get a big signal boost to be successful to be generally successful on Kickstarter is that true I would say that is not true. I also think that that's like a very uh, sort of one-sided definition of what success is. Uh, success uh, can mean a lot of different things for different creators, uh, you know, depending on what you're doing. I think that, you know, in order for a crowdfunding ecosystem to work, it can't actually be all blockbuster six-figure-plus projects. Um, you, you want an ecosystem to be diverse, any ecosystem. So there should be the small projects, there should be the mid-range projects, uh, what I found is that uh, I think that most importantly, I think the viral aspect helps, but most importantly, I do think it's figuring out where your community lives on the internet um, because they will push your story out there and share your story. Um, there's a small project um, called Sunny and the Elk that was, um, it was a young girl who wanted to get... Um, research done on this ancient elk skeleton, elk skeleton she found in a lake um, with her father and so she got scientists involved um, and she was, nobody knew who she was before she did this Kickstarter project but um, I'm sure that her story, the story that she had crafted around this helped lend to uh, people spreading this project um, you know, across different social media channels and uh, media outlets and it ended up getting funded. It was a small project um, but how, much, how much money? I'm curious. Let me just double check that. Um, I believe. Moving into the light again. Give me one second. Well, while she's checking that, uh, Ethan, what's your take on all this? I bet you're you're boiling with things to tell to say. I can tell it. I can tell. 
No, I mean, I think I think I agree with what Aurora is saying. I think you know people tend to a lot of the the press that surrounds like the the unicorns, you know, the six figure raises, the Veronica Mars movie, uh, and there's a fair share of science projects like this, um, the Arcadi uh, space telescope that raised over a million on Kickstarter. Uh, again, there was a product involved. People were going to get a selfie from space um, that helped incentivize a ninety nine dollar contribution. But people tend to see all these unicorns and think I'm, I, virality is essential. But I think if you look at the average size of a Kickstarter campaign, it's not, you know, it's, it's, it may be thrown off a bit by that. If you look at the median, my guess is it's probably, you know, it's bigger than experiment.com, which I think is in the single digit thousands, but you'd have to get me on the facts in that Aurora. But I think the, app, the median size campaign on Kickstarter is not a six-figure project. It's, right. it's bread and butter type projects. I, I mean, I just want to be really clear here because I feel like you guys are misrepresenting me a little bit in that I'm not talking about you know, those kinds of really big projects is the only kinds of successful models in crowdfunding. I'm, what I'm saying is that, you know, I have a lot of media training, a lot of outreach training. I've been on NPR, I've been on television, I've been on documentaries. You know, I know how to communicate my science. Um, I have a, a larger than average following on Twitter and, you know, hundreds of thousands of people read my blog every year. And I'm not saying that to toot my own horn, I'm saying that because it was still difficult even for me to raise $10,000. And most scientists are not at that level. They're not at, at this level in terms of outreach training and communication training. They're not at this level in terms of an audience. And so I, I just, I feel like there's a little bit of a disconnect between what, we're, what I'm saying and what you guys think that I'm saying. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not critical of the crowdfunding model. I just think that it's not as easy as people, some people make it out to be, and I don't think that it's necessarily a panacea for some of the funding issues that are out there. And I think that it's important that we talk about some of these struggles and issues because, um, you know, we can use all the sort of, you know, business language that we want to, um, but it, at the end of the day, you know, we still have these real issues that we're struggling with. And, um, you know, if, if it was hard for me, it's going to be hard for a lot of people. So I, I just... I just would, you know, I think it's important to get that perspective out there, which is why I wrote the post. And the post wasn't just critical. The post mm -hmm. talked about all the positives, and you know, I. But I do think that you know we can't just sort of brush these these other criticisms under the rug necessarily, and, and, or, 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 or imply that we're just doing it wrong. So uh, yeah, I, wanted, well. I think we're just simply saying that uh, yes, it's hard work. Whoever told you it was easy was lying to you. Yep. You should listen to them. And yeah, that's, I, that's a fault of the press that that make that whips up a frenzy and makes people think, well, geez, all I need to do is yeah. get viral and I'm done. Um, and that, you know, if you study, if you do, if you study what a crowd, if you look at the anatomy of crowdfunding campaigns that work, you realize it is a lot of hard work. And yes, of course, it's nothing should be taken for granted. Even if you have twenty thousand followers or fifty thousand followers, I think follower people obsess about follower account. I don't think that necessarily matters in the end of the day. The reality is sometimes the campaigns stand and fall based on the content. Mm -hmm. And sometimes content is abstruse, or sometimes content doesn't have a community yet, or, or the community is not easy to find, um, which has nothing to do with the model itself. Um, maybe just not enough people are into that area of science, and they need more education before you can expect an audience to, to fund it. Um, and that's totally acceptable, I think, or predictable. So al along those lines, just really quickly, one thing that was really interesting um, is, you know, I tried a lot of angles in terms of trying to get people to um, to give and also to share so that we would reach as many people as possible. And I tried the, wow, the science science funding situation really sucks angle. You should you should support, you know, the next generation of science scientists angle. I tried the, we're a diverse group, but, you know, it's all women scientists. Like, support women in science angle. I tried, you know, penguins are threatened and it, this is, you know, really urgent need and climate change kind of angles. And the one that worked the best out of all the different angles I tried in sharing this on social media was fake penguin facts, which was just me <laughs> late at night getting punchy after being tired of asking people for money over and over and over again. I started tweeting silly fake penguin facts and people would retweet those and suddenly we'd get these big bursts of giving every time I tweeted a fake penguin fact and that worked better than any of like than any real penguin facts that I was tweeting. And so I don't know what to make of that, but I'm just throwing that out there. So Jacqueline, I'd like to ask you a question. Is so I'll get to you, Lenny, in a second. Is that so, Jacqueline? You've got to be in the top, I don't know, one percent in terms of scientists to engage. You know, in terms of the effort you put into it, in terms of the followers, and all that. As you say, like you're like very few are at the level you're at. And so, Mike. So from that perspective, you know, you've heard my position is that eventually, uh, out, crowdfunding is a way to incentivize outreach. 
Do you agree, or does it, yeah. or does it not, or does that not make sense? Given, I mean, given... I found out. I've always found outreach to have its own benefits. I mean, I've never felt like it was just a chore. I've I've gotten lots of personal and and and. I found benefits to myself and to my science, um, and so I've never felt like it needed an incentive. Um, but I, I definitely think for some people, it adds an air of legitimacy when I talk about my tweeting um, and my blogging to, to, for example, administrators. You know, they often wonder, you know, what's the use of that time? And and being able to tell them, well, the use of that time is ten thousand dollars, or the use of that time is, you know, leads me to these speaking engagements or things like that. I think. Um, you know, those are incentives to, to other people who care about that. Um, yeah, but I mean, I just find that it's, I, I've never necessarily needed, an, I, I've never ne needed a monetary incentive for outreach. But one thing that I do like about crowdfunding is that it makes people feel connected, personally connected to what they're funding in ways that they wouldn't if they were just listening to NPR, for example. I mean, I don't, I don't feel as invest, I don't feel more invested in NPR just because I, I'm a giver, right? But if I give to a science project, I really care more on a personal level about the process that goes behind that science. But the challenge that I'm finding is how do we get to the people who don't already care, right? How do I get to the people that aren't already scientists or already engaged and and pull that new audience in and that I don't have the answer for that so it isn't that part of a broader problem I feel with science communication generally is that I think all of us as scientists trying to engage with larger audiences I mean, we're, I think we're all struggling trying I think we're all really good at engaging with people who are already shall we say science inclined you know but how do we reach people who maybe are not reading the science times every day or you know or how do we I think that's a I think that's something of a broader problem don't you think no I mean I, I absolutely agree and as you know as I said when I got onto social media in the first place the goal was not to network with scientists it wasn't to d develop trusted relationships with science journalists it was here I'm a publicly funded scientist I'm at a land grant institution I am going to disseminate my information I'm going to share with the public you know I'm going to give them an opportunity to see what a scientist is like to communicate with me, um, I'll be a resource, and that was the hardest thing to do in terms of broadening my audience. And in fact, the again, getting back to the signal boosting idea, this idea that we need help. Um, for me, the the best, um, the 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 most successful opportunities I've had to reach, you know, just regular people who aren't scientists or science communicators, is when WordPress freshly presses one of my blog posts when they basically boost that to the broader blogging community. I get a flood of new followers, a flood of people who are just regular non-scientist folks that stumble across that and then suddenly become interested in Ice Age horses. And, you know, again, it's like, I need that help, right? I need that signal boost from either an organization or somebody famous like Arthur Chu to help me reach, you know, those, those bigger audiences. I'm, Lenny has been patiently waiting. <laughs> Sorry. So no, no, I'm great to hear from no, you. No, no. But Lenny, please, uh, please go ahead. So I, I, I think my big angle in all of this is I just want transparency, and I want us not to forget that we are at a point where across NSF funding rates are at five percent, right? I think it's ten to fifteen percent for NIH, and I think a lot of the people that are going into crowdfunding are the people who have been applying over and over for grants, getting rejected, and they end up on this platform thinking, and I, I know some of these scientists, right, tenured scientists at MIT in Berkeley who have been contacting me and saying, do you think I should list my project on Kickstarter um, or on experiment.com? And they don't even have a Twitter following, right? Um, but it's this rejection, it's this crisis in biomedical funding that we have that's channeling a lot of the people into experiment.com. And so, then the question is, if we are up front with the scientists who end up there, that, and I, I had a back and forth with Daniel Luan, the co-founder of experiment.com, about this, and we're trying to calculate of the 600 projects that were listed on experiment.com. If you don't have a 5,000 strong Twitter following and are not a celebrity scientist, what are the chances that you can get $5,000? And I think we ended up with something like, I was saying it looks like about 2% chance that you can get $5,000 after a month of prior work. And he was saying, oh, I think maybe it's 8%. Whatever that number is, if this is single digit, right, for a graduate student that we're talking about, if this is a single digit probability of success after a month of work for $5,000, well, if people are okay with that and there is incentive and they think this is time 
well spent, and this is outreach, and they're happy to do it, and it's exciting, great. But a lot of the people are leaning on their friends and family, they're passing the head, they're feeling terrible like I was feeling during our Kickstarter campaign. You feel like you're in the begging mode, right? Is that an incentive for public outreach? Thoughts from other people. Well, I'm then just, I'll, I'll <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I guess I was just going to say quickly, um, I wonder, it's, it's almost like there's this tension or a disconnect between the scale at which crowd, you know, the group that needs the crowd, crowdfunding or the crowdfunding would work well for, which are grad students, right, these pilot projects. Um, and also the the training in, in outreach, and then you know they but yet yeah, they're they're the ones that don't have the reach, right? And so we we need almost like some professional cheerleaders, right? Like the one downside of experiment.com is that they don't boost your signal, right? They're just the platform, they and they help you build a really great one, but they're not they're not signal boosting you. I think the biggest signal booster would be the universities, but they have a conflict because their advancement development office wants to hoard all the cash for themselves. And but they could set up easily set up a fund yep. where there's like a matching fund for if you're a grad student and you go out and you raise two thousand dollars, however however much you can raise in a month's worth of the as I say the flawed charitable social media driven marketing campaign. If you can get a certain amount, any amount, there should be a fund available at your local university that allows that allows matching. And so again, everyone's trying to make this work on the back of a charitable social media driven campaign. It will not work. And I'm sympathetic to the fact that maybe the community of scientists and science appreciators will evolve the way gamers and artists and musicians cultivated their base, but I think it's a way bigger ask um, because science is just a lot more challenging. Um, so again, let's not try to scale this on the backs of the campaigns we ran because I think the reality is that's not going to work. We need to come up with new tweaks on that and then put that out into the marketplace and encourage people with appropriate top-down support to then go ahead and try to experiment, not just go into a buzzsaw. Of course, you don't want people to be going in and, and having to be dispirited by not getting you know, $5,000 when they could have spent that time not getting you know, $25,000. At least they feel a little bit better about themselves. So um, that's my two cents. There's, and there's, that thing is very common uh, within, so after, you know, um, it took some time, but consider matching is very common with uh, arts organizations and um, other organizations that work closely with people who are making things, um, and I see that as uh, a very sustainable model for science crowdfunding, and we're already seeing it happening, um, even for some of the, um, you know, other science projects that have been on site um, for maybe not... Uh, universities, but um, organizations that uh, provide uh, grant money for challenges uh, and STEM stuff like that. So one problem though with the university, I mean I agree that they're the ideal sort of level for this to be happening, but I'm already starting to hear stories of universities that are getting wise to the fact that we're bringing in money that doesn't bring in indirect costs or overhead and yeah. they don't like that and in some cases they're shutting that down, right? Yeah. I mean even when I, I mean I was the first person at the University of Maine to do it, and when people figured out that it was happening, there was de there was a definite moment of, oh, wait a minute, do we get our cut? And we had to have some negotiation about that, and that was not something I was expecting, um, and it all worked out okay in the end, but I definitely, there was definitely a, well, next time you need to do this through us. We need to be involved. And um, so I think they're getting wise, and so there, there could be some opportunities, but also challenges associated with that. So I think a thing that we haven't talked about is like many people have mentioned that it's going to be it would be hard to imagine a universe where crowdfunding could replace uh, government and NIH funding. But I think it's hard to imagine a universe where anything could replace NIH funding. I was on a panel recently with the head of a major medical foundation, and she showed a graph showing that the amount of funding major medical foundations provide for biomedical research is nothing compared to government government and uh, private R and D funding. Um, so I think you know the there's a, there's a broader issue of the overall funding crisis in science, which in some ways is like a, a a broader problem, you know. And can crowdfunding solve that? Well, obviously not. Um, but I just wanted to mention that is that because even other groups like wow, like wow, you know, wow, the Moore Foundation they could solve this problem right away, and the Moore Foundation would say we sure can't. <laughs> uh, so we are nearing end of our time, so I think we've had a great discussion. Are there any final points people would like to leave with? Uh, maybe we can go around, and I think pe uh, project people are working on they'd like to talk about. Ethan, I'm going to start with you, because you have, you, have, uh, you have a very exciting project you have underway, which is namely your new kid. 
So congratulations on being a new dad. I had to put that in there. Yes, that, that's basically my, my full-time job right now. So <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Aurora, I cut you off. Uh, I'll just say that uh, if he has uh, a project that they're thinking about doing and are considering Kickstarter, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can reach me at science at kickstarter.com and also Space Hurricanes on Twitter. Um, I'm available. I'm happy to advise um, and help out. Jacqueline, any final thoughts? Um, yeah, just that I think that um, we, you know, this is the science that crowdfunding science is one part of the the science funding ecosystem, and we need to be thinking about creative ways to reach the communities that we that can help us avoid some of this donor fatigue that we talked about, and also that it's not it's not a replacement for traditional funding, which I, I know we all know, but I, I've heard conversations that um, people are, are are considering this is the way of the future, and um, I, I I would be really hesitant to to, to to go down that road. Lenny. Well, I think it's appropriate for me to mention that the final product, the result of that Kickstarter crowdfunding for Protocols IO is live and functional and uh, we would love for people to go to protocols.io or on the mobile and start sharing their methods, their knowledge and discovering up-to-date science knowledge. Um, so. That's well, great, and I've got something I want to plug, uh, which is that SciFund's about to launch a new class, which is a class on uh, how to put together a good poster for your conferences that are happening this summer. So, a little whole class on poster presentation. We'll be launching that next week, and so you, you can follow you can follow our blog, uh, you can sign up for our email list, which is at scifundchallenge.org, or check out our website. So, with that, I'd like to thank our panelists. Uh, uh, for, for this great conversation, um, and I'd like to thank you, audience, for showing up. Thanks a lot, and I'll see you next month.